basically, Naval is giving us three different parts to his statement. The first part that really struck me was that the Catholic Church was right, that contraception was the end of the family. Now, a lot of people are not aware that this was a position of the Catholic Church, um, but weird. there's a really famous, I've never been able to dig it up, I've looked for it. If anybody can find the link, please let me know. But there was a famous article in the New York Times, I think it was the 1920s, right around the time there was kind of the early stages of contraception conversation, the pill hadn't been invented yet, but um, the Catholic Church was very much saying, this is a terrible idea. And, and, uh, and so the writer for the New York Times actually laid out the argument against contraception. Can you imagine this? And so the, their argument was, well, if we bring in contraception, essentially what'll happen is the family will be over, divorce will skyrocket, there'll be, a, there'll be enormous amounts of uh, sexual promiscuity, um, children and women will suffer the most. I mean, it really described in detail everything that happened over the, the, uh, the years after the 1960s and when the and contraception became completely ubiquitous, everybody just accepted it. And I, I don't hear this conversation happen very often in, in Protestant circles. And, and, you know, you see this a little bit more in Catholic circles, but basically most Protestants have completely um, accepted the idea that contraception as a technology is just an, an unambiguously good thing and that we should be planning our families um, with the utmost of like uh, just proactively thinking through when is it right? When, when do we start? When do we stop? I mean, exactly the same as the culture. The Catholics are very against this idea, of course, officially, although Catholics, practicing Catholics by and large have no problem with uh, contraception. Yeah. And so that's an important distinction. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, the, the single um, priests of the Catholic Church are very against contraception. The, uh, the married families of the Catholic Church, you know, it's very split. And unless you're a very observant Catholic, you tend to be a little bit more. So that's the, his, the first part of his argument is the Catholics were right. And I 100% agree with him, but this is not a conversation we're willing to have, especially within Protestant circles. That's his first statement. The second statement he's making is that there is a coupling or a bundling of these things that is, that's inevitable, right? So the bundling of sex with, with marriage, with, uh, with child rearing is a bundle that we needed to fight to keep completely uh, together. And so what the technology of contraception does is it, is it disentangles the bundle and all of a sudden now you just unleashed immense chaos. Um, and the thing that he's describing is basically that's the, the end of the sort of assumed way that the family is designed to function. You're, going, you're basically bringing into existence a different thing. Um, I 100% agree with that as well. Again, another conversation I think we're not willing to get into the details of because it curtails freedom. I think that's one of the things that people have to understand that because we've adopted the position in the West that freedom is the highest value, any technology that comes along and, and, and gives us freedom is unambiguously good. And any of the side effects of that are, are, not, are no longer assigned to that technology. The technology is good. We know it's good. We know contraception is always good. Thank God we have it. Um, however, the, the chaos that, that was unleashed, it just so happens to correlate with when we began to embrace this freedom, then they're not connected. Um, anyway, I think that's the way the conversation is being framed. And I think it's really weird and unfortunate. And so, but it's really hard to have this conversation though, if you don't go the other direction. And the third thing he said is it, it when this happens, um, then the regular healthy family becomes so rare that people are going to do what he calls choose your own adventure families. And then he gives us, you know, crazy example of a guy who is basically having children with his ex-wife. And if he just came out as gay, everybody would accept it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of funny, but anyway, yeah, Phil, anything in that that you'd want to react to? I'm curious how, how you, uh, that struck you. Yeah, a lot of thoughts. He strikes me as the kind of person that uh, some have described as reality respecters. That's, um, yes. I don't know who, I don't know who coined that. Maybe James Wood. Um, but unbelievers that are nevertheless reckoning with the downstream effects of bad philosophies, of ideologies, and they're making course corrections. And he strikes me as a guy who's willing to basically question received wisdom, right? And he's saying, we've all been told that these are a de facto good. And he's like, I look at the actual outcomes and I say, hmm, I don't know about that. And I think that's a good sign. And, and, um, you know, evangelistically, I think the reality respecters are 
the most ready crop of people who are rethinking through some of these fundamental questions. Uh, because, you know, if you question contraceptives, you're really questioning sort of the whole liberal approach that you just laid out, that freedom is always more freedom and more liberty is always better. Um, and if you question that, you, you start to pick at, you know, the foundations of, of the whole morality. And that, I mean, obviously points you very quickly to uh, wh where does our moral uh, foundation come from? But yeah, to return to contraceptives, this is definitely something Protestants were mostly asleep at, at the wheel um, when this came through. And I think the church uh, largely analyzed it from an individualistic point of view and said, we can just leave this up to the individual conscience. The Catholic Church took a more societal scale approach. They, they analyzed it at a deeper level. Mm. And I think they, they, they had already a, a body of reflection that they were self-consciously working from, the Catholic social teaching. And they were able to see, in a way that Protestants mostly missed, the, the 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 societal scale effects if this became widespread and there's a there's a famous um pope he wrote a an encyclical called humanite vitae and um and it basically just art made this made this argument succinctly and, and powerfully and i think so you you're saying that protestants mostly aren't willing to have this conversation and i think that's probably true but i would say now more than ever um, there is definitely, uh, among thoughtful Protestants, a willingness to say, okay, we, we, we really missed something here. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what strikes me as well as about, about what he said was, you know, this, these bundles of, of goods, you know, and, um, it's, it's really a pro tradition argument because he's saying we took, we pulled these apart. And we didn't realize that they were held together for a reason and that there were so many downstream goods that we didn't realize were connected. And it makes me think, you know, if you I, I think of it as like four things, sex, love, covenant or marriage and children. And like at the most hedonistic approach, you just have sex separated from everything else. Then in the more sentimental sort of secular approach, you say, well, sex should always be coupled with love. And then the Protestant church has been good to say, well, actually, sex should always be bundled with love and covenant and marriage. But like you said, they've mostly missed that sex should also be bundled with this package of children being part of that picture. And uh, the Catholic church, I think, you know, got that right in a way that the Protestant ch church has mostly missed. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, those are some thoughts there uh, as I, as I listen to that. And it's very interesting to see two clearly secular guys having this kind of conversation. Yeah. They're both totally atheists, Scott Adams and Naval Ravikant. Um, you know, you, you listen to the whole conversation to get deep into, uh, AI and, and possible simulation theories and futures and time. I mean, it's just like, you know, they're, they're very like free thinking atheists, right? Um, but both of them feel like something radically crazy has been, has happened to the family, 